Thank you so much. Um, I, th I hope that was a nice introduction. Um, as, as mentioned, this will be in English, so you must be warned. I'll try and speak slow. I, I can get quite excited about this pretty nerdy topic. Um, and another thing to add, this, as you can see, this is in, in Serbian slash Croatian language, Slavic language. Yeah, this is language, so, which, which I haven't picked up on before arriving here. So I have my own laptop here with some of the more technical quotes. I'll be looking at this from time to time to, to read up on it, just so you know. Um, and please feel free to shoot in questions and also let me know if I'm speaking too fast. Um, as mentioned, this talk will be about meat and masculinity. Actually, very much, um, in some ways, very complementary to Mislav's uh, presentation earlier here about how we can rewire masculinity and, and veganism to fit better together. Um, and the subtitle is called Managing an Appetite for Meaning in Modern Consumer Society. Because we talk a lot about uh, our calorie needs and, and feeding the growing population in the world. Um, so there's, of course, a very, very biological need we need to fill. But at the same time, there's a lot of culture in how we eat and how we perform our identity. So we need to take this meaning aspect into account as well. And I think she already introduced me, and this hopefully means I have, I have a master's degree in philosophy and business management. Uh, and I work with uh, Provet International. Uh, I'll just speak briefly about that. It's an international food awareness organization. It's active in around 20 countries. Um, and we work with governments, politicians, a lot all over to try and transition towards a more plant-based world, both for the animals, climate, everything. So. Yeah, just so you get the context of that. I've worked as a campaign manager there. And for those of you who are very interested, I know there's minimum one that is. There's a, this is my preferred reading list. So a lot of the stuff, uh, I did my master's thesis in philosophy and business management about this topic. And these are some of the books I used that are really interesting and inspired me to look into these, these issues. Um, on another note, actually just, uh, that I actually forgot. Thanks for inviting me to come here and speak. And thanks a lot to Tamara, who's been doing all this uh, translation. Uh, she sat up quite, quite long throughout the night, I know. And I gave her some extra changes that she was sitting and implementing right up until this talk. So thanks a lot. Um, so really, really good book. I'll, I'll, be books. I'll be happy to share my slides afterwards as well. Um, so, just to, to go through the th themes, this is a bit of an overview. Um, boom, boom, boom. So, we'll be talking about culture and consumption in the modern consumer society, how that looks like, and anthropocentrism in Western culture as well. Are you familiar with this uh, concept? Most of you are nodding, yeah, great. It's a bit, it can get a bit nerdy. Um, and then, the role of meat consumption within this Western anthropocentrism. And then this very interesting question that might be relevant for a lot of you who want to do corporate outreach. Can adding a veggie burger to a menu actually destroy a country? And we'll, we'll get into that question as well. And then one way to address these issues that I'm looking at. And then, of course, some, some bonus info. Because I think there's a lot of people who are active in the plant-based or vegan movement. And a lot of other people. And we usually have this image of an enemy, right? Who's the real supervillain in, in the Western society? Um, and there's some, we have some uh, bits on it here, right? For a lot of vegans, is this guy who slaughters the animals. Uh, here we get a bit more political, and here we have, probably familiar with Monsanto, this big evil agricultural company. But actually, uh, I'm here to tell you that the, the scary truth is this. This is the real supervillain, and I'll, I'll explain in detail later on. Do you, are you familiar with this guy? Yeah, okay, great. Um, yeah, so. I'll get back to that, but my first sort of inquiry, what I got curious was that when I was looking into, you have these meat burgers, right, made traditionally from meat, uh, this one over here, a traditional hamburger, right? And then you have the Impossible Burger, which is one of the new generation of plant-based meats. It's a startup in the US. It's one of the food companies in the world that has had most money invested in it before it even had a product on the shelf. It's a plant-based burger. They use this non-heme iron, which is very similar to heme iron, which is in blood, 
which give meets it metallic taste and makes it very umami that people say this might be sort of the secret ingredient to making meat meat um, but they actually they I've, I've tried it myself in the US as well it, it's really good I can't really remember the original taste of meat it's been a while but the main point is that they they are very similar if you gave it to people who wouldn't think about it, who are traditionally eating meat or not, they would eat both both of them. They couldn't taste the difference, I would, I would wager, unless they're very, very looking into it, right? But then if you would tell somebody that this one is actually made from plants, there might be a few people, and I've experienced this as well, who wouldn't like to eat it. They're like, nah, that's not really for me. I'm like, why? It had this like taste, texture, it has the calories you need, it's flavorful, why wouldn't you eat it, right? There's something, there's something fishy there. Um, so zooming back a bit, uh, Martha Saraska, the author of this book I mentioned earlier called Meat Hooked, she asks uh, this question, why do we even have these fake meat oddities? I know uh, Mislav was quite interested in this vegan bacon he could get up there and this other traditional uh, creation dish with, that comes from the pork, it's, it's, it's a fat, right? That was. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, why, why do we even have that? Like, there's vegetables and other types of protein, but meat, meat alternatives have been around for centuries, right? Um, but we don't make other alternatives to people who are allergic to stuff, like nuts or something like that. Um, so one way of looking at it, why we have these, is to think of meat alternatives as a complement, right? They say uh, imitation is the most sincere form of flattery, right? So why are we imitating this? Because meat has played a huge part in human culture for a long, long time. Um, he was also talking about it earlier in our sort of evolutionary history and how we understand ourselves. So what I asked the, the question in my thesis here is when Pat Brown, who's the founder of this Impossible Burger and this company behind it, he's, he's a scientist you know, look, looking into what's the missing molecule of meat that we can take, find it somewhere outside of animals, put it in a, in a burger, and then create, create this uh, secret, secret ingredients. I'm actually saying that instead of looking at a biological uh, component, it's actually a question of what I call meat physics. So a nerdy term for the metaphysics of meat. It's more a cultural component that he should be looking into. Because the taste, texture, and all that we actually have, but it's in the story of the meat. So, um, these are some of the, the reasons that people eat meat, and it's also these four out here are what traditional marketing companies, when I did some of the research into it in the plant-based meat industry, they're looking at these traditional marketing parameters, such as taste, texture, affordability and availability. They want to get the price down on meat alternatives. They want to have it taste good. They want to have the texture be, to be there and exact, of course, and they want it to be available. So you don't have to go to obscure little shops to get it, right? And that makes a lot of sense. Um, but they're not really looking into culture that directly, which uh, Martha Saraska as well says, there's some biological reasons why like meat, when it came out, uh, when we started hunting and we ate, there's a lot of density in the food when we finally, uh, we found a corpse of a, a dead gazelle or whatever, and there's a lot of density in it compared to the things that we could scavenge for elsewhere. So there's some biological components, perhaps our brain screw a lot more because we could get all that protein, everything in once. We don't need it in the current states of our food production in society now, but maybe back then it played a huge role. But she says the cultural components are actually more powerful. They, they are the ones that keeps us coming back to it and can make it so hard to quit. Uh, one way of, of looking at, which for me illustrates well why and how culture plays such a huge role is this quote from a Danish professor who says that the Danes feel the same way about their meat as Americans feel about their guns, right? I don't know how familiar you are with our gun laws, but they're very protective of it. You really can't go in and take away their right to, to defend themselves with, with guns, right? Yes. Yes, I will do that. Thank you. Um, but I think you can actually translate this into a lot of cultures, right? You could argue the Croatians and the Serbians feel the same way about the meat as Americans feel about the guns. I think Americans feel the same way about the meat as they feel about their guns. Uh, and just to define, because that can be a, a bit of a broad concept, culture, 
This is Grant McCracken, also author of one of the books I mentioned there. He says, by culture, he means those activities and ideas that we construct ourselves with, right? We perform our gender, uh, our nationality with a, with a lot of different concepts, right? And a, a, a big component of how we, we, we form those uh, in modern, modern society, you know, this massive pyramid of needs, right? Traditionally, when you look at our consumption patterns, when we eat, the way we dress, uh, we look at, tend to look at it as the physiological needs, the biological ones. We need to have calories to sustain ourselves, and uh, we need clothing to keep warm, of course, right? But actually, with a lot of um, what we, in modern consumer society, we're over-consuming. We have too much of all these things, right? We have more clothes than we need, more food than we need. So a lot of our consumption patterns is actually up here. In, uh, in self-actualization, right? Uh, we perform our gender, if we want to look like a businessman and look smart, or very female, we wear a dress, right? And it looks weird if a man is wearing a dress, right? He's performing something we're, we're not used to. Um, so there's a lot of hidden sort of cultural signals in that. Uh, and just a brief model of how it works, and I use the concept of Lego, it's, it's from my home, home country, Denmark. You have these societal ideals, right? You can see here, how do you build the soap war machine from Marvel, but let's say this is the concept of a real man, right? This is how society says it's put together. Then you have the building blocks, which is the consumer goods. You can buy this clothes and you eat that, you w drive this car, and there you kind of get to this constructed notion of self. Um, and that basically means that in modern consumer society, the, the mantra is, I shop, therefore I am, right? It's the way we perform our identity. and. Luckily, of course, vegans don't need to do this. We're very above and beyond needing to express ourselves in any way, so no need to worry about that. Um, okay, but I think you, you get, the, get the thing. We perform our identity with our consumption. That, that seems like it's, it's settled, but what about meat then? How does this play in? So, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with these, these two memes. They came from when I was, uh, I was online and I saw uh, a meat eater uh, battling with a vegetarian or vegan online. And uh, the, uh, the meat eater posted this saying, vegetarian is an old Indian word for bad hunter, right? And, and then he, of course, scored some points. And then the, the vegan came back as a comeback trying to win this and posted, meat eater is just an old Indian phrase for bad gardener, right? As a comeback. So um, I would like to just show, see a show of hands, which one you think is the most funny one. If you think it's uh, this one, please raise your hand now. It's not, it's not a trick or anything. You're more than welcome. You don't have to feel, feel judged. Who, who thinks this one is the most funny one? Well, okay, there's not, not a lot of uh, takers there. Maybe they, they both suck. That could also be, be the case. But anyways, I would actually argue this is, is slightly more funny when you look at it. There's a lot more history to this one. You can really imagine a guy coming back from the savannah with no, no meat on his shoulder. He, did, he couldn't break down like uh, a, a gazelle or whatever. He couldn't catch it, so he comes back. It's a bit of a sad story, right? Um, and this one seems, even though it's a good comeback, it's structurally very much the same joke. But it doesn't have that history to it, right? It's a bit boring being a gardener, not, not cool, manly, and sexy, right? So when we go a bit below these... Yeah, no, it's not. So um, I actually saw another meme where it's like this buff bodybuilder vegan guy, and it says, vegan is an old Indian word for the guy who had to stay at home in the group in the camp with your wife when you left hunting, right? And I would say that one actually kind of wins back, because then you reclaim masculinity in this way, right? Um, but looking, looking below these memes, you actually see a larger ideology at play, which we could call anthropocentrism and biocentrism are at play here. Um, you don't have to think too much about these, uh, these quotes down there. And also, this is maybe a bit too normative. It's just something I found to illustrate how we look at anthropocentrism. It, anthro means human, so this, that we're centering our culture around human beings. Uh, and basically looks like this, right? It's a moral hierarchy where you have, especially in Western society, you have the male on top, uh, women, and then you can't start having all these different types of beings and then down here till you get to plants. A biocentric worldview is one where we're like all whole and all this. Um, and actually for a lot of uh, vegans and vegetarians, that's what they switch over to, this more whole way, a biocentric worldview of looking at 
they get they, they get a sense that they have a new found respect for for animals around them they see them as more equals instead of above they don't like to think of themselves as owners of their dogs right but they see themselves as partners so there's some shift in the mentality even though they might not think too too uh, consciously about this I'd be happy to share my slides as well if that would help afterwards um, yes and this is why I needed my own translation here so just to define anthropocentrism here it says it's the philosophical viewpoint arguing that human beings are the central or most significant entities in the world this is a belief embedded in Western religions and philosophies it regards humans as separate from and superior to nature and holds that while human life has uh, intrinsic value, value in and of itself, while other entities, including animals, plants, minerals, resources, everything else basically, they're just resources that can be justifiably exploited for mankind. So this is a bit, it's embedded in our way of thinking and even though we don't make it conscious. And there's all this, this guy here, Arthur Lovejoy, a historian and philosopher, he said, Western anthropocentrism, or you would call it the great chain of being, is his word for this moral hierarchy, is actually one of the, the most powerful and pervasive ideas in Western thought, that we are above, right? And I'll, I'll get into that and how that looked like a bit more. Um, and so coming back to the real villain in society, this is basically what, what it looks like, right? It's this, this little person here inside of us, this West, Western, the face of uh, Western anthropocentrism. And how it looks like, you said you've all seen the movie. And if you, if you recollect how, when, when the Western society, when we went out, when we came, for example, to, the, to America, and we, we went there, we had a, you could see, we had a similar sort of reaction to the natives over there and the nature, as, as Buzz Lightyear did. When he first comes out of his package, he thinks he's landed on this other planet, his first reaction is to shoot everything, right? And you could argue that's what Columbus and a lot of the settlers did. They're very hostile and the nature over there was seen as something that should be cut down and it needed to be civilized, right? Uh, even though I don't think that's how the Native Americans viewed, viewed their lands. Um, and this also includes a very t uh, technological domination over nature. This is embedded in the view, right? Everything needs to be set under control. We need to pave the roads. We're not living in harmony like they would be doing Bhutan or other places, right? And it also sets, as you can see here, when, when, when he finds out his laser doesn't work, he can't shoot, shoot the other guy. He's like, well, at least there's no intelligent life form. There's nothing on par with me, right? And I think that's how we've always, from a Western standpoint, when we come to other cultures, we've seen them as below us. They're not as civilized, at least, right? Uh, they're closer to our evolutionary ancestors or whatnot. Um, and another thing that this does, it sets sort of human beings as, as the measurements of, of, of everything, right? So you have uh, Western anthropocentrism views humanity and whatever we define that is, as this way that we measure everything else against, right? It's a bit of an unfair thing because you could say there are many different forms of intelligence or ways of being and seeing the world in other cultures and in other beings, right? But we all measure it against one thing. And then there's also, following this very technological domination view, um, there's this blind belief in, in financial growth, right? We need to expand, and now we're thinking about going to the other planets, and it's very with this uh, grab-and-go culture, right? We, we colonize it. Uh, if there are other beings on other planets, I don't know if we'd be as friendly, hopefully, when we get there, right? So this is his motto to infinity and beyond, right? We just, there's this uh, saying that a person who believes in infinite growth on a planet with finite resources is either a madman or an economist, right? So it's very built in our way of understanding our financial system. And one way of looking at this economization, uh, and Tamara actually managed to translate it here, so I'll I'll uh, let you guys read it a bit and see what you think. This is from a magazine for broilers, so if you're a farmer, you could look up in this magazine and see what types of chickens you can buy. And I'll, I'll let you guys read it for, for a little bit, if you, if you can all see.
So I don't know how it, how it seems to you necessarily, but I, for me, you could actually you could put another word in there, like a fridge or a car or anything that needs to be more efficient, more economized. Um, but this is actually like a living being. But it's been very, um, it's been bred to, you know, they have problems walking, but they're twice or four, four times the size of traditional chickens, right? Just to get more meat, of course. So it's, it's like trying to turn them as close into a machine as possible with this economic way of thinking. And there's, a, there's one price to be paid. Of course, we get more meat faster, but one price to be paid, summed up by this quote from a philosopher who says, we men pay for their increase of power with alienation from that over which they exercise that power, right? So as, as we're sort of pushing ourselves above it, we, we, we also remove ourselves con from connecting with it. You could say the same with nature or, yeah, women to a large degree in, in the more male-dominated parts of the world. And what's also behind all this is a concept called human exceptionalism. This, this is also embedded in this, this view that humans are, are superior in a lot of ways. Um, this is a guy who wrote a book. Uh, it's called A Rat is a Pig is a Dog is a Boy, The Human Cost of the Animal Rights Movement. He argues that when, when the vegan community tr tries to, to illuminate some of the atrocities that we're committing to, towards non-human animals, and we're saying they, they should have rights, they have feelings, they have sentience, uh, and what I think what we see ourselves as trying to do is to raise them up, right? To so say, like, hey, they shouldn't be living below this, this threshold of compassion. We should have them up here. But how he sees it actually that we're lowering everything into this muddy mess where you can't really know what is what and it's going to mess up our whole uh, way of seeing ourselves in the world, right? There, so there's actually a bit of a, um, it, it functions a bit like a species minority complex, like, oh shit, we're being threatened by the status of other human, like, but I don't think we should be that scared of them, uh, to be honest. But yeah, that's basically what it says. Um, and as you can see from the quote, he thinks very highly, and which I think there's some, it's nice to have pride in being a, a human being. I haven't tried anything else, so I don't know, but I think it's, it's a, yeah, it's not a bad thing, but when it comes to that, and that he can't really, he feels threatened by the advance of, uh, of rights of other sentient beings, there might be something wrong. Okay, so anthropocentrism is very rooted in collective identity, right? But I actually haven't gotten back to the question of meat yet. Um, and this quote by another one of the authors of the books that I brought up there sums it up. And he says, it's not that we, if we eat meat, that we consciously like ponder, okay, now I'm going to perform that I'm above all the other species, right? Uh, but we are brought up in a culture where that has, you could call it like a bit of a point system, right? For dominating nature and all these other things. This inner bus light here is always there on the shoulder saying that you can score points, the b more bigger car you get, the more all these things, the more you, you, you dominate nature, right? Uh, as uh, Mislav's um, presentation here also, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't see all of it, right? But it, it makes sense that it's also seen as less masculine, right? You can't really perform your identity with it. So people don't really necessarily think consciously of it, but meat has been a primary way of distinguishing ourselves from nature and performing that we are above it. Um, and another interesting part is it's not like meat, as you can see, it requires tons of resources, a lot of you probably know, right? It's quite expensive, there's a lot of subsidies going into it, but that's actually one of the reasons why it's so valued. So when we try and say, it's, well, it's actually cheaper to just eat chickpeas and all these other things, it, it's not as cool to be doing this. One, one good example is uh, a Hummer, you know, right? Now it's getting it slightly unpopular to have. It's a military vehicle and then civilians started driving around in it. And one way is to show off that they had enough money because it's really bad on fuel, right? But it's a way to demonstrate if you go in, if I would change my, uh, I would buy a new white shirt every day and toss out this one and put it on Instagram just to show that I had a lot of money. It's a similar thing, right? So there's this expression, nothing's dumber than a Hummer, but people, they still do it. Luckily now it's changing a bit, that people are being more critical about it, and a lot of millennials are growing up with this concern for the planet, and climate change is one of the big narratives, so there's a, there's a change among young people, um, but still. Uh, and developing further on it, you probably, seen these right as well slightly like uh, vegetarian is an old Indian word for Lao Tzu Hunter uh, this says bacon cheeseburger because I didn't fight my way to the top of the food chain to become a vegetarian 
and this guy's saying, I can't live on rabbit food, right? I'm a warrior, right? And you've seen those, right? Uh, and what this comes back to is this, this great chain of being in the present state that is, is now, which is less of a sort of religious, spiritual thing, it's, it's more embedded in a lot of Western science, um, and it's now being reformulated as what we call the food chain, right? Um, so actually when, when people say that they're plant-based, vegetarian or whatnot, I don't know if you notice, you sometimes get the same reaction that I think Galilei got way back when he said that the Earth is not the center of the universe, right? He said it's actually the sun. And that messed up with, with a lot of the way that uh, the church was thinking about it back then, because there's no, we're set here by God and it, this is the center of all universe, right? But actually, if you, if you then say, okay, it's the sun, it doesn't really matter too much. Like the rent is not gonna go up or gravity is not gonna start working, but it's how we view our place in it, right? So this is this type of insecurity that this, this guy wrote a book about. And coming back to this again, how this relates to, to masculinity, and this is one of the, the other books as well, um, that in male-dominated society, which most societies are at the moment, um, men get male identification through, through eating meat, right? And vegetables and other things are seen, seen a bit more as female food. Those are like, we're the hunters and they were the gatherers who go out, right? Uh, it's interesting that I think way back when we were hunter-gatherers, around 90 or 80 percent of all our calories actually came from gathering, from the nuts and seeds. We didn't go out and hunt it every day. It won't be a very small intake, but what it did bring when we had a kill and we brought it home to the tribe was that it became very political. It became power, power tool or tool towards power because we would have a lot of food that would go bad very soon. With all your nuts and seeds, you could save it and, and carry it on, but you could just, couldn't just leave. This was before we had refrigerators. You couldn't just leave the meat and you had a lot of food there, so you would share it out. And therefore you became like the good hunter and you became a bit more higher up the hierarchy, right? Um, so this is still embedded in a lot of the way we think today. And it's not just on a philosophical level. There are some other interesting studies. This is one from the Norwegian uh, Armed Forces, the military there. They try to uh, get meat-free Mondays adopted there, so one meat-free day a week. And it actually says that one of the main barriers to implementing it was, even though they're also, they didn't really teach the chefs to cook that well, so, and there's nothing worse than like, bad vegan food from scaring away people, that there's a lot of resistance to reducing meat consumption because what the Norwegian soldiers thought uh, meat is very associated for them with protein, masculinity, and comfort, right? So you're taking that away. Again, so that if you have these two burgers, one is the plant-based and one is the meat, uh, traditional meat burger, only one of them is going to satiate this other type of, of appetite, right? And just to, to give a, how to say, like a bit of a, a nuance to it, this, this Bio, biocentric worldview that I think more of you would subscribe to um, and I put up this warning like don't google it at home you get all these crazy hippie shit about yeah floating around through space and everything but I would say this guy Peter Singer has a really good uh, take a good perspective on what anthropocentric or biocentrism should be um, and basically the argument goes like this that m traditional sort of anthropocentrism or other moral hierarchies, they, they view membership of our species, homo sapiens, as the only criterion worth of, of moral um, importance. But using that, that criteria is actually very arbitrary, right? Why would we use that? Why wouldn't we use uh, being eight feet tall or something else? It's just something we picked, right? It doesn't have to be with whether or not we can feel or anything. So one, one good criteria says that's not irrelevant would be the criteria sentience that you can feel pain and experience a life and a world right which a lot of animals could do so if we have this criterion using sentience uh, as a criterion um, that means we should also include other sentient beings of course which a lot of uh, plant plant-based and vegans are already doing um, and so we should extend our circle of compassion to include these other animals. So that's one way of expressing a biocentric worldview. Another way of doing it, which I think is a really a beautiful way of, of looking at it, is this guy who's a uh, Sioux chief, Luther Standing Bear. Um, I'm, I'm gonna read it as well, but you're welcome to read it in the, uh, this version as well. He said, we did not think of the great open plains, the beautiful rolling hills and the winding streams with tangled growth as wild. 
Only to the white man was nature a wilderness, and only to him was the land infested with wild animals and savage people. To us, it was tame. Not until the hairy man, hairy man from the east came, and with brutal frenzy heaped injustices upon us and our families that we loved, was it wild for us. When the very animals of the forest began fleeing from his approach, then was it for us that the wild west began, right? It's very interesting when you look at the traditional settlers that came there, and they called it the wild west, right? They landed there, they, they set up a lot of cities on the east side of, of America, and then they ventured forth into this wilderness, they call it. But actually, like that's not how they were living in some somewhat in a harmony, right? Uh, the, the native um, Americans, but but it's actually only when when the the white settlers came that it it was called the Wild West because they brought it with them. It was an attitude, right? Um, but then again, still, uh, this is how we kind of dealt with it, right? It, it doesn't really look, we look down upon that. I'm probably not you in this in this room too much but it's, it's not really seen as yeah it's a hippie and it's a bit it's a bit weird and emotional um, okay so coming back to it uh, now we know all this stuff okay it's embedded there and but we don't really have to do it because you can still uh, yeah you can still live there's enough calories to go around all that so can't we just tell people uh, and it would be good I think there's uh, people hope that this is what it looks like when you do this cube of truth, for example, right? That you're actually inviting them up to grab these two pills from the matrix. Um, if it was just only that easy, you could just put it in people's drinks. Um, and can we sort of break them out of this, what we call the matrix, right? Just a mental prison break. But you've seen the movie, it can actually be quite hard to break out of that. And I'll, I'll get into why a bit. Uh, coming back to both, there's this issue of anthropocentrism, so how people in general, both male and female, and others who who look at themselves as, as apart from nature, right? So that can be threatening to them, but especially with uh, traditional masculinity, right? Um, it's also from, from Carol Adams, who's the author of one of the books. She was interviewed a lot later, and she said that traditional masculinity is now being threatened by feminism, the gay movement, metrosexuality, and all these uh, fathers who like stay at home with their kids instead of going out working, right? So old school masculinity, it needs to be reaffirmed and one way to do this is to connect it again with eating a lot of bloody red meat. Even though you didn't have to go hunting for it, you just had to drive down to the supermarket. But it still carries the symbolism with it, right? As you can see, it's a bit, bit this feeling of like, okay, what, what's, what's a man to do in the modern world, right? Now women are taking our jobs and like, how do we actually navigate here? Um, so it's, it's this defensive identity pattern to, to defend your identity. Um, and there's studies showing that when your identity is in some s state of flux, when you, let's say you move to another country or you change, you become retired, you change age group, right? So in these circumstances, you're actually usually, you reach out towards your favorite material symbols to reaffirm that identity. So in Denmark, there's some, some more national movements going on, more nationalistic, and the Danish flag becomes very important to, to put up everywhere. And, and pork, uh, meat, meat from pigs, is also very important. They, they try to get it like mandatory in some schools because it, it's uh, one of the ways our economy grew, uh, like around 30 years ago, that we're good at producing pork, we export a lot of it. It's like a traditional food, right? So it becomes very important to put this out. And there's also this example of the midlife crisis for, uh, for a man. He's like, oh shit, I, I'm feeling older, but then I, I, I changed my, my, uh, my car to a younger model and my wife as well, just to make, make sure that I can feel young again, right? By exchanging these symbols. Like a bit clinging to something, um, and there's also studies being shown that actually, when when you pose a, a fact to someone that is counter to something in their identity, right, the same centers in the brain light up that as if they're under attack, if somebody's feeling threatening towards them, right, because their their sense of identity is being threatened, so they feel this might, it can be similar to the way of sort of dying. It would only be the ego, but that can be scary enough. Um, so coming back to this interesting question, right? Can, if you add a veggie burger to a menu, can it destroy a country? And there's an interesting case from, uh, from the US. It was Good Food Institute. They did a petition to this uh, burger restaurant called in and out It didn't have any veggie burgers, so they did a big petition and had people vote if, whether or not they should include one. 
And some of the feedback that they got, this woman who was in charge of it on the social media, she came back after they launched it, the day after she opened her, uh, her f Facebook uh, inbox, and she saw these kinds of comments that you are t attacking a Christian business and it's wrong. You seek to destroy American values and are hell-bent on ruining everybody's good time. You're seeking to create a gender-free, multicultural safe space to cuddle in that's populated by the worst types of humans. And I'm not sure if that was part of her evil scheme, but at least like when you think about adding a burger, they're not taking away meat from anything, but they're putting in this symbol that a veggie burger presents of this progressiveness or whatever it might be. So there can be some backlash, right? And so coming back to how we can address this, uh, this military study, what they found is it actually, to overcome some of those barriers, it would actually help to formulate uh, Meet Free Mondays or whatever else kind of program or intervention. If you translate this into an ideology that the soldiers or whoever you're targeting can relate to. So you can actually have them stay in their ideological comfort zone, which can be scary due to some of these reasons. You can't just poke them or give them the, the truth pill or whatever. For some people that doesn't work. Um, so one way of doing that, uh, and I think we had a good example of the guy presenting before me. Uh, this, this one example here, I call it gender construction site. It's an example from uh, the it was a building site in Spain, where there's a, there, it's a construction site and there's mostly males working there. And they were having a lot of injuries to their heads, uh, serious head trauma, because nobody wanted to wear a helmet. They did, didn't find cool. So they put up this uh, poster saying 90% of all these really serious head trauma could be avoided if people would just wear helmets, right? And they thought, okay, problem solved with this campaign. But nothing happened. So they send in this behavioral philosopher, she called herself, and she was listening to the norms of the place. Why is, uh, are people not wearing helmet? And she found out there's this macho attitude in the locker room. It's like, ah, oh, come on, don't be a girl. Like, don't wear a helmet, it's not manly. Just like, okay, if this is what is addressing it, this idea of trying to perform your masculinity, if we then put up a poster she made with, it's like a, a real man, quote unquote, with a helmet on, holding his, uh, his wife and his little daughter, and it said, real men can uh, take care of themselves and can continue to support their family, right? And this completely changed everything out there. Everybody started wearing a helmet, right? And you can also hear, you can almost imagine it in the locker room, like if somebody, like a young guy comes up and says, oh, come on, grandpa, don't be a woman, don't wear a helmet. You're like, oh yeah, you don't know yet, but when, when you have responsibility as a man one day, you'll understand, right? Just like kicking him right back in the balls. Um, so I think there's these ways of rewiring. If you look at masculinity, it's this floating concept up here that and unless we all go Buddhist, we might want to aspire towards having an identity place somewhere, right? So I don't think we can just take we can't just take that away, and we can't just teach Buddhism to everyone else, because that might be also seen as trying to create a um, gender-free, multicultural safe space to cuddle in, right? So, but what we can do is rewire and actually show uh, that there are ways of uh, eating plant-based and still being a man, and actually being a more of a protector sometimes. Uh, one interesting example from this book, I recommend not reading it. It's a historical book, it's really, really boring, but it has some interesting uh, points about how the vegetarian movement grew back then. So we were back in the year of uh, 1860, and this guy who was named the Vegetarian Ferryman, he, he rode continuously for 80 hours from Boston to New York, it's over 400 nautical miles, and did it primarily on a plant-based diet. And this is the first time that uh, vegetarianism or, or veganism, they didn't make much of a distinction back then, was mentioned in very positive terms in, in, in media that actually fit with this dominant ideology of, of the states. You have to be a real strong person to take care of yourself there in the wilderness and all that. Um, so it's associated with strength and other things, right? And that makes it uh, accessible. It, it, it helped make it a lot more mainstream that other people could identify with it and not just us hippies. Um, so one way of looking at it, you have this tr very traditional, what, what these guys stand for, very traditional masculinity, and you have the, the plant-based burger over there, and you can actually try and connect some of those values over there, right? Um, make some sort of marriage between these so it's not that dangerous for people who identify like this to eat like that. Uh, and some other good examples, um, on Schwarzenegger, he's, to my knowledge, not uh, entirely plant-based, but he, he's 
gone out and said stuff like this that he sees a lot of it, uh, bodybuilders and everything else, weightlifters, that can actually show that they're strong and healthy. And you can definitely build muscle. This is Patrick Baboumian. He's broken three world records. Uh, he's, he's vegan as well. And yeah, I saw him give a presentation one. He said after he started breaking world records and becoming famous for doing this on a plant-based diet, that a lot of young men was actually, ah, now they feel that they can actually go and do that because they have a role model. They don't feel alone out in that. So it's a one way similar to this uh, construction site back that, right? Giving good role models for people out there because um, there's not a lot. And he is also featuring featured in this movie that's coming out uh, hopefully early next year, The Game Changers. What the movie does, it it's basically it's, it interviews all these athletes, um, showing that you can perform really well, you can win, you can become, there's martial artists in there, there's a lot of things that are considered very traditional masculine. And you can, you can still build muscle and you can become a better killer even on a plant-based diet because you can perform well. You could still argue that sometimes nothing's dumber than a Hummer. Sometimes I feel when I'm out there presenting about the end of the world because of climate change due to livestock and uh, seven, uh, 70 billion animals suffering and all that or our health being destroyed by it, but that people still want to build muscle. It can be sometimes feeling a bit uh, interesting why they can't just see it, but actually it seems like one of the bigger barriers sometimes. Um, Another interesting concept is this, um, which is called clean meat or cell-based meat. I don't know, are you familiar with this concept? Just briefly, yeah? So, yeah, sure, so very briefly, I'd love to chat more about it at some point. Um, it's actually the process of taking DNA or a biopsy or from an animal living, it can be done without harming an animal, you just need the DNA. Then you put that in a container, similar to a brewery of beer uh, with nutrition, and you actually grow stem cells and you can grow meat, right? It's at the moment super expensive, it's people in lab coats and all that, but they can scale it up and they're projecting that it will become price competitive and even cheaper than traditional meat because you don't need the entire animal and, and all that, it will, it will be much more technical. But the interesting story is here for me that there's all just protein and it probably will be healthier to live on a whole based uh, or whole foods plant based diet. But as he says here, um, you're familiar with what's called the first domestication in, in human histories when we took in animals and we started farming with them, right? And we created livestock many, many years ago. And this is what he calls the second domestication because now we're going in and we're actually uh, domesticating the cells of the animals themselves, right? That means this, this, this story, this narrative is intact of human beings being still on top, right? We're just controlling in a different way. It actually, it, it takes away all the bad consequences. It's a lot better for the environment. You can, you can uh, play around with it so it's, it's healthier because you don't have to have all the bad stuff from meat in it. Um, and it's a lot better for the animals. But it still has this, that it's still real meat, right? So it might perform better with certain segments of society that are not, that are not ready to eat a, a veggie burger. Um, so I'll, I'll try to, to sum up. Um, consumers in, in modern society, we perform our identity through our consumption levels. Anthropocentrism is very uh, central to what we understand ourselves as human beings in the West. Um, meat consumption is then very um, central to the, the identity that we have in the West. So it's very sort of aligned with our ideological comfort zone. And when people feel a threat to their identity, uh, they might seek out symbols that reinforce their traditional identity. And um, it, it functions similar to a, min a minority complex, right? When you're scared of something about yourself or feel ashamed about it, you defend it or you don't really want to talk about it. Um, so it, it functions similar like that. So sometimes coming in with too strong a vegan message or other things might actually push people away because you're like, oh, you're messing with, with something that they, they care about and they don't, don't feel like discussing. So ways to go about it is either like this clean meat or, or, or just having more people that can actually show you can, you can do all the cool stuff uh, and drink a lot of whiskey and beer and smoke and uh, some of the cooler traditional masculine values st while still li living on a plant-based diet. Yeah, and that's all. Uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it was not too fast uh, and too furious. Yeah, thank you. If there are any questions, I'd love to take them or else find me later on. Yeah, well, thank you. No questions? No? 
Uh, thank you, David, for this really wonderful lecture. I was wondering, um, you talked about anthropocentrism uh, and this defense mechanism against other species, which is called speciesism, in fact. Uh, so these um, solutions that you proposed seem to work great, but do you think they can help in solving speciesism? Because many people uh, feel like they do want to eat an animal because they're simply species. I mean, so yeah, if you can comment on that. Um, it's a good question. I think I would ask, uh, answer with, with an analogy. Um, I think you should always be careful when you compare this, the vegan movement with other traditional social justice movements. There's um, a person who said about slavery way back when, about the South, that their economy was very dependent on slaves to gather cotton and all that. They're very cheap labor, right? He said it's very hard for someone whose livelihood depends upon a certain thing to criticize it, right? Uh, as we, we discussed er, like yesterday, actually, when you said, if you're, if you're uh, smoking, right, you said you quit. But now it's a lot easier to have this discussion with you about how cigarettes can be bad for your health, they're too expensive. You're much more open to having this conversation when you're not addicted to that anymore. So I think a lot of these ways, it's a bit like a nicotine gum to some degree, right? Where you get people off it for a little while or we, yeah, um, get an alcoholic to stay sober for, for a while to get, get some distance from it when your, your identity is not actively connected with this activity anymore. And then it's a lot easier to have this dis discussion. There's a lot of topics that you and I could discuss a lot more freely because we're not involved with them, right? Um, yeah. So, so that, that would be my, my, uh, my comment to that, yeah. Okay. Well, thanks a lot again. Uh, and I'll, I'll be here if you want to chat more. Thank you.